Hello, Tom. It's super to be on point. It's wonderful to have you back. It's a half a dozen years since we yeah. last spoke. You and your husband, Paul, were both here. So indeed. On uh, And the theme has not changed entirely, I must say, but still here you are half a dozen years later writing that getting people's minds around this idea, this fact as you have it, is still a, a challenge on a scale of Galileo persuading people to stop thinking of the Earth as the center of the cosmos. Yes, I, I think that it is actually a, a sort of revolutionary thought, although, you know, at the same time, it's rather an old thought because Hippocrates, the ancient Greek physician famous for his Hippocratic Oath, Hippocrates also thought that what we feel and think and decide is something that is done by the physical brain. And now, of course, he didn't know about neurons and he didn't know about circuitry, but he realized that ultimately it's the complexity of the brain that makes these things possible. Uh, yeah, that's a long time ago, but sure, the other view was strong for a long time after. I mean, all the way up as you write into the 16th, 17th century, you've got Descartes, uh, believing that the brain, you know, its uh, first uh, function was executing movement commanded by the soul. So he did. And, and in Descartes' case, I think part of the reason that he thought there had to be a soul independently of the brain was that he couldn't quite figure out how it could be that a mere physical device could be creative in the way that language, for example, is creative, or in the way that you can make a decision about um, a project that is entirely new. You face a new condition, you make a decision about what to do, and yet that's not something that you've ever done before. And so I think Descartes was motivated to suppose that maybe there had to be this other thing that somehow interacted with the physical brain, but that was itself completely and utterly non-physical, and that somehow worked according to principles that were utterly different that from the principles that would control the nature of matter. You know, Galileo had to move what the presumption, the common understanding of, of people from the earth at the center of everything uh, to quite different uh, picture understanding of the universe. What, what's the shift from, from what to what that you're trying to lead us to? What's the common understanding that you're challenging? What's in, in very straightforward terms, the view that you're championing, Patricia? I think the idea that I hold, but that is also held by, by many neuroscientists, but also by, by various non-specialists, too, is that in ways that we don't yet fully understand, it's the brain that creates our sense of self, our sense of being an individual that persists through time and that makes decisions and sees and moves and so forth that it's the physical brain that is conscious or that goes to sleep and is not conscious. It's the physical brain that learns to pick up the habits and conventions and laws of the society we live in and that sort of grows and develops our moral sense that the this all ultimately comes from the physical brain and that the brain that humans have in its basic structure and organization shares so much with the brains of all mammals, but not just mammals. It shares much with the brains of reptiles and even in many respects having to do with neurons and circuitry and neurochemicals the human brain shares quite a lot with something like a fruit fly. And so what is surprising or what surprised, I think, the people around Copernicus and Galileo mm. was that the earth does not seem to move. If anything seems to be stationary, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. seems to be immovable, mm -hmm. it's the earth itself. Beneath our feet. Mm -hmm. Beneath our feet. And somehow... We have to let that go, and we have to realize 
why it seems like that, but that in actual fact, the Earth is moving very fast around the sun. So that's, and, that's Galileo and the Earth. When it comes to humans and our minds and our sense of ourself, what is it? that you're saying we have to let go of? What's the shift that's Galilean in scope? Uh, you, you sort of described your understanding of, of, of what actually is. What's the shift away from the, the, the old view that you're saying, enough, let it go? Well, there are many aspects to the old view. One, I think, is that is the Cartesian idea that there is the brain, all right, but independently of that, there is this non-physical thing, which is the soul. And it's the soul that does the seeing and the thinking and the reasoning. And if we're lucky, the soul survives the death of the physical brain. And that probably is, is incorrect. It looks now as though there is only the brain and its interactions with the environment, that an independent soul that, that somehow without causality, but just sort of somehow um, is aware, thinks, reasons, falls in love, hates, goes to war, and so forth. No, it's just the physical brain. Now, when I say just the physical brain, of course, I have to allow that the physical brain, especially in the case of primates, the physical brain is astonishingly complex. And that's why we can have such a conception of uh, ourselves as having a soul. But in fact, I think there is no soul. Is this, I mean, you know that for many the answer will be yes, but for you, is this a diminishment of human beings, this perception? I don't really think that it is. I think in an interesting way, um, it, it actually enhances the depth of our understanding of ourselves and our place in the universe. As I mentioned in the book, I, I think like many biologists, I have a feeling of great connectedness to the universe by virtue of seeing how the human brain is so like the brains of others and how it is that, for example, when I care for my children and offspring, that that's very like the circuitry that's behind how a dog takes care of her pups or a pig takes care of the piglets, that, that we share something. And I think that that in a way, it it also frees us from certain kinds of bonds of fantasy about what souls are and what they do and what might lie uh, in the, in in the next world. And in that respect, I think some of the Buddhist um, dispositions here, or some of the Confucian ways of thinking are kind of more helpful in that they don't necessarily envisage this kind of soul thing, this sort of spooky, ghosty thing, but rather view life in very pragmatic, practical terms about how to have a meaningful life and to get on well. And so in part, I guess I feel that the neurobiology that we're coming to to understand is is actually quite liberating in many respects. Though it pulls the plug on an awful lot of thinking and religion and spiritual uh, theology. I mean, you you describe getting on an elevator at a conference, joining an anthropologist who got on <laughs> earlier, and she turns to you in fury and hisses, "You reductionist! How can you think yeah. there is nothing but atoms?" You said it was as though the word reductionist was in the same league as Gestapo or arsonist or hired assassin. You've had some pretty furious reactions to these observations. I think that's true. I think that that part of it is based on a misunderstanding. Of course, when I say that there isn't a soul independently of the brain, it doesn't mean that there isn't a role for psychology in understanding the complexities of behavior at the behavioral level. And I think much of 
really important work has come out of psychology, for example, in the case of vision, in trying to understand um, the nature of visual illusions or how it is that we can see in three dimensions. Um, so it, I, I think some behavioral scientists have thought that if the brain basically holds the story, then nothing but basic neuroscience is relevant. With neurophilosopher Patricia Churchland, she says your brain is yourself. That's it. There's no more. Get over it. Her new book is Touching a Nerve, the Self as Brain. You can read an excerpt at our website, onpointradio.org. Uh, Patricia Churchland joins us from Vancouver, Canada. Lots of people eager to speak with you, Patricia. Many uh, on writing online as well. If I may, uh, here's, here's just one of many notes from Cynthia. She says, if, and it's a big if, we understood the brain at least a bit more than we understand it now, I might give this opinion some weight. But we aren't even close. Cynthia doubts that we know enough about the brain to make this profound assertion of fact. Well, I, I appreciate Cynthia's caution here, and, and I try to be quite cautious in the book also, um, in, in that I agree that there's much about neuroscience that we don't really understand. Um, but on the other hand, the, the, the general evidence supporting the idea of a non-physical soul is extremely weak. And when you look at that evidence on the one hand and you sort of stack it up against the evidence that there is only the physical brain and that when you perturb the brain or change the brain, that results in changes in how you feel and think, then we tend to think that it is in fact the brain that's doing those things. The other difficulty, I think, with the notion of non-physical soul is how it's supposed to connect with or causally affect the brain and how the brain is supposed to causally affect the non-physical soul. I mean, Descartes actually recognized this as a devastating problem and he didn't really know how to solve it. And most people who still think there is a soul have no idea either. So here, here's one take on it, mm. and that is that if there is a non-physical soul that somehow causally interacts with the brain, then a very deep law of physics gets challenged, and that's the law of conservation of mass energy. So you're injecting into the physical world this whole new causal chain, this whole framework of energy, if, the, if there is really a soul that causally affects the brain. And nobody has the slightest idea how that could happen. But moreover, since the law of conservation of mass energy is really, really deep and really, really deeply confirmed, it makes us think that, yeah, it's not really the soul that's doing these things. It's the brain. It might not seem like it, but it almost certainly is. You, you concede that there's a lot that is unknown to uh, Cynthia's point. You say for none of the higher functions, including retrieval of autobiographical memories, problem solving, decision making, consciousness, why we sleep and dream. Do we have anything close to a complete and satisfying neural explanation? We have no idea at all of the neurobiological differences whereby one person is thrifty, another is a spendthrift, why one person finds math easy, another struggles, why one is vindictive, another easily forgives. That, that's a lot of unknowns there. That's a lot of unknown territory. <laughs> it is a lot. Um, it is a lot, but it's like the early stages of many sort of surprising developments in, in science so that even when Galileo and Copernicus realized that the Earth had to be moving around the sun, there were still many unknowns. How is that possible? Where does the movement come from? What kind of a thing is the sun? What are those other things up there? Does this mean there isn't a heaven? And so forth. So there are still many outstanding questions within neuroscience. On the other hand, it's very interesting to see that even in something like, say, consciousness, we have actually made kind of stunning progress so that we can see that when 
as you do every day or every night, I guess, when you go to sleep, mm. you lose consciousness. Mm -hmm. And we can chart in the brain some of the very specific activities that change when you go from this remarkable state of being aware and alert into this state where you are not conscious. What's the significance now, of those changes during unconsciousness? Well, I think that what it tells us is that when consciousness changes in this way, it's the brain that changes in that way. Now, we don't precisely know all aspects of the nature of these changes, but that just means that there's always additional questions. Uh, but we do know quite a lot about it, and we do know that there are other changes within the sleep stage that then take place so that you might engage in dreaming. And we also know, which I think is kind of cool, why it is that you don't act out your dreams. So there you are running feverishly to catch a bus, and of course you're naked, and of course you can't mm. catch the bus, mm. and all hell right. breaks loose. Right. Um, why aren't you why why aren't your legs moving? And the answer is because there's a very specific mechanism in the brain stem that turns off all the motor signals that would be coming from the cortex going out to the body. So it's not that the soul does this. It's that this very specific set of neurons just turns off these other guys so that you don't move. Now, if that mechanism is broken, if, for example, there is a lesion owing to stroke or degeneration, you will act out your dreams and you will get up out of bed and go crashing into the walls. Mm. This isn't a story about the soul, although it might feel like a story about the soul. This is a story about the brain. There is a and lot that's upended in, in that. There's a, a lot, lot that's upended. And, and so... So we learn more about consciousness as we look at sleep and dreaming, as we look at the, how anesthesias are achieved. It's all done by the brain. It's not that when you have an anesthetic, somehow the soul is affected. It's just the brain. Patricia Churchland, you write, though, that special sensitivity halos, interesting word, our sense of self. <laughs> no kidding, like uh, to the thousands of years of culture. David in Amesbury, Massachusetts is calling. David, you're on the air with Patricia Churchland. Hi, Tom. Thanks. Mm -hmm. um, first, I want to say I, I totally agree with um, Professor Churchland. I think the apt metaphor is uh, mind is to brain as shadow is to body. But I'd like to have her return to the problem of consciousness, because we can say it's an emergent phenomenon, but that just covers up our ignorance. So I wonder if she can tell us a little more about consciousness. Thanks, David. Patricia? Well, I'll try to do this in a, in a, um, a quick way. It looks like there are several important structures that provide the background, and these involve links between cortex, which is very important, but subcortical structures. And there is a kind of link between these two so that, in a way, what happens is that during the conscious state, um, there is a kind of broadcast uh, over wide areas of cortex that basically says, you know, sit up and take notice, things are about to happen. And then there are other structures involved that shift between, say, being conscious of a funny smell or being conscious of seeing a blue heron or being conscious of the need to swat a fly. And these shifts we are beginning to understand that take place that move you from one region to another region of um, of the cortex. Now, in deep sleep, that whole system changes and kind of gets turned off. And that whole system is also affected during anesthesia. So uh, the the system involved in it, it involves the the what's called the central thalamus uh, uh, that is a, a kind of donut within the thalamus and that projects very widely to all regions of the cortex. So that's a, a, an important part of the story. And so 
attention seems to be a critical part of the story also, and the neurobiological mechanisms of attention and why we shift from one thing to another, from the smell of smoke to the fly that's buzzing around your head, is also under study. But that, too, looks like a sheerly physical brain mechanism that is sensitive to things like risk, need, drives, memory, and so forth. Uh, so mm. that gives you a bit of the story, but I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, in short time, it's not very adequate. Um, though, uh, you say there's enough known, as you put it, uh, to begin to free us from the leaden shackles of ignorance. Patricia Churchland writes in her book, The Concept of the Soul, though having a long and respectable history, now looks outmuscled and outsmarted by neuroscience. We've got big, big, big shifts in thinking underway here. Patricia, stand by in Vancouver. Elizabeth in Montreal, Canada. Thanks for calling, Elizabeth. You're on the air. Yes, um, Dr. Churchland. As a hardcore materialist, um, in moral thinking, all you can do as a scientist is locate the area of the brain where thinking lights up under a scan. You simply cannot tell me the what that goes into the thought or the, excuse me, or the how. Only the where, the locale. What about moral, what about reflections regarding our own mortality? And also I have another point that I'd like to address and that is why isn't the neural activity not simply accompanying thought in the human sense and just causing thought as you claim? Why is it always causality as materialists? In, in the materialist sense, and not just contigu contiguity. Sorry if I'm like... No, no, that's quite all right, Elizabeth. Yeah. With with yeah. all that, and I'll put it to Patricia, but I, I hear you sort of pushing back against the idea of brain equals self, period. Scientists, lo tell me anything other than the locale. Oh, well, here is where such and such occurs. Oh, here is where other things occur. This is where moral thinking occurs. This is where fear occurs. This is where pleasure occurs. What about the thinking that go or the thought processes that go into the actual, you know, result of you know your thought? We've got it, know. Patricia Churchland. What do you say? Yeah, no, that's that's a really good question. I think that for certain techniques like um, scanning and imaging, you're right that all you can do is say something about where relevant activity is occurring. But in fact, for other things like decision making, there are other techniques, techniques that address specific activities of specific neurons and cells that do actually shed light on the how of decision making. So for example, work by Mike Shadlin and, and um, his colleagues has helped us understand how neurons can accumulate evidence about a decision to be made. And then at a certain point, when the uh, evidence is sufficiently strong, the neuron fires and the decision is made. And so we're beginning to understand what accumulation of evidence and integration of evidence looks like at the level of the circuitry. And similarly with regard to something like memory, although there's much about um, memory for specific episodes that we don't understand, we do actually understand quite well that what those changes must involve are physical changes at the points of connectivity between neurons, at the synapses. And a great deal is known about how synapses are modified, what it takes to modify them, and how the memory is literally embodied in the circuitry itself. Mm. So, so uh, it kind of depends a little bit on the technique, but if you assemble all, a whole lot of techniques together, you get much more out of neuroscience than just where a certain activity is taking place. You actually get the story of how. It happens. Patricia Churchland writes that when she first held a human brain between her two palms, she, she writes, I muttered to myself, is this really the sort of thing that makes me me? How can that be? That's many years ago. And now she writes, my brain and I are inseparable. I am who I am because my brain is what it is. 
in her new book, Touching a Nerve. Patricia Churchill, please stand by in Vancouver. I want to bring in a professional philosopher to respond a bit here, if I may. I want to go to Conover, Wisconsin, uh, to Sanford Goldberg, professor of philosophy at Northwestern University up in Wisconsin uh, today. He's not sure that all the answers lie in the brain. Sanford Goldberg, Sandy, welcome to On Point. Thanks very much for being here. Hi, Tom. Good to talk to you. Big, broad terms. How do you respond to what Patricia Churchland describes as the weight of neuroscience evidence here and her conclusions? Well, there's, there's a, a tremendous agreement, I think, between Professor Churchland and myself. I've, I've been a big admirer of her work for, for many, many years. If I had to add one critical dimension, it would be that, um, and I, I don't actually know that Professor Churchland disagrees with this, that even after we know all that we can know about the brain, I think we still don't know all that we would want to know about the nature of ourselves. There's a lot more than just the brain, even though I, I tend to agree with her when she says that we will learn a tremendous amount about ourselves by learning about our brains. What else is out there? I mean, she, she was pretty clear in saying, look, this is what there is, and it's not small. It's a lot. It's a profound uh, instrument, if you will. Uh, but that's all there is. What could be beyond those boundaries of the brain, Sandy? So there, there are... In fact, one of the things that she said in the first hour, hour, uh, half hour mm -hmm. struck me as quite interesting. She said it's the brain and its interaction with the environment. I, I tend to think that many of the things that we're most interested in uh, as humans about ourselves is our interactions with the environment. And by environment, I include not just the physical environment, uh, but also the social environment. And in particular, much of what we're interested in when we're interested in ourselves is our relations to others. That's that was picked up by one of your uh, phone callers who talked about morality, moral judgments. I regard those as judgments regarding our relations with others. One other thing that I would add, and again here I'm pretty confident that Professor Churchland would agree with me, when we think about the brain, it, that can encourage the thought that you're thinking about an organ in a person's head and then... If you understand that and that alone, you've understood all that you need to understand about the brain. Yeah. But, of course, the brain evolved. It evolved uh, in part. Uh, part of the explanation for some of the features that it has now is that it served our ancestors very well in, in, their, in their environments. So it's, when I think about the brain, I also want to think about its history, and I mean the species history. So I... I all I want to suggest is that we have a, a, a broader view on all of this. Would, would that, we'll come to it. Would that leave room for a soul, or is that still outside the boundary of science here to your mind? Uh, I tend to agree with her that souls are, are things that I don't understand, and I think we can probably uh, say all that we want to say about human beings without having to advert to souls. So there, I think, is a point of agreement. I'm Tom Ashbrook. This is On Point. We're talking this hour about the brain and the self with neurophilosopher Patricia Churchland. She says your brain is yourself. That's it. There's no more. And get over it. Her new book is Touching a Nerve, The Self as Brain. She joins us from Vancouver, Canada. Sanford Goldberg is with us as well, professor of philosophy at Northwestern University's Weinberg College of Arts and Sciences, author of Relying on Others. Joins us today from Conover, Wisconsin. Patricia, I wish you'd pick up uh, on... Uh, Sandy Goldberg's observation there that we, yes, a lot of agreement, he says, but there's so much history to the brain, there's so much evolution, evolution in a social and cultural setting that maybe the sort of meat upstairs doesn't fully capture what's going on. Well, I, of course, I, I agree with that uh, in the sense that um, there are interactions between the brain and the environment. And in particular, in the case of mammals, and this is really the heart of my chapter on morality, um, there are really important interactions between the brain and the social environment. And that there is a kind of tuning up that involves the reward system in the subcortex. Um, there is a kind of tuning up of the reward system via approval and disapproval to the local conventions and practices, to the ways that others are, to acquire then expectations of how to behave and what's appropriate, to model yourself after other individuals and so forth. So, of course, the social environment is extremely important, just as the physical environment and its spatial relations are extremely important. Um, so, by saying that there's just the brain, I don't, of course, mean that there is only my brain, but that there is my brain 
in a community of other brains and that those other brains interact with my brain in such a way as to change me profoundly. Does that satisfy so, your question, Sandy? Well, there's, I, I think there's a lot that I, I agree with in, in what Professor Churchland just said. Um, I'm inclined to think rather um, that that the, the rhetoric of just the brain makes me worry that when we think about ourselves, we're thinking about our brains and how it affects us, whereas I like to think rather uh, human beings as, as biological organisms, that includes our bodies. It also includes our relations to others, in particular other human beings, but also the rest of the, of the world. So it may be just that this is a question of, of how, we're, how we're expressing our views. I don't know that there's any profound disagreement. I tend not to want to focus just on the brain, even though I have to agree with her. This is perhaps the, one of the most important parts of, of the full story. But again, uh, what else is there? And Patricia's telling, even your observation of history and culture would be, uh, I guess, manifest in this plastic brain over time. I mean, if there's something more that has to do with our thinking or being, what would that be? I, I don't know that I would want to put it quite like that, Tom. I mean, it's, it's okay. slightly differently. Um, I, I do worry, and this is something that I, I think uh, Professor Churchland is to be commended for. She's one of the forces that has, has really had profound impact on, on philosophical thinking in these matters. I tend to think that we can also confuse ourselves by thinking too much about things like thinking and consciousness if we don't ground that kind of thinking in the physical realities of our brain, our central nervous system, our bodies, and our relations to others. So you then ask, okay, what else is there? And, and I guess the, in my, my own research, I'm particularly interested in certain kinds of inter interactions we have with other human beings. That's the sort of thing, that's another thing that's out there. That is something that Professor Churchland herself acknowledges. I tend to focus on that in my research. She tends to focus on the brain. Um, but in, I think there's much more agreement than there is disagreement here. But, but does she, I mean, Patricia started out as a s straight up philosopher. She moved to being a neuro philosopher. Does she put uh, straight up philosophers like you, Sandy, out of business? That's a great question. And in fact, when, when we read the Churchlands, when I do philosophy of mind, I will raise that question explicitly with my undergraduates and graduate students at Northwestern. I tend to think that um, she doesn't so much put us out of business as actually force us to radically rethink about what value we add to uh, our self-understanding. And I actually think that's a great thing that she's done for the profession, because I think that uh, philosophers, like other disciplines, we can, we can sometimes spin our wheels and not, not have great, uh, fruitful discussions. If we are just our brains, what value do you add? Uh, so that, that, again, is a great question, and I can give you this one person's view of that. I certainly can't speak for the profession, and I'm pretty confident that, that others in, in our profession will disagree. I tend to think that what philosophers can bring to this is, is um, an understanding of the kinds of things, the kinds of creatures we think we are, clarifying that, making sure that we understand exactly what we think we are, and then relating that or de de determining that it's not relatable to the kinds of things that Professor Churchland and others are talking about when they talk about neuroscience. Um, that kind of clarity, for whatever reason, I think philosophers are very good at. I think there are other people who are good at it. I think we're good at it as a discipline, though. Patricia, let me ask you about a question that you raise. I think it's related here. Uh, you say, you write, so probably the soul and the brain are one and the same. What we think of as the soul is the brain, you write. And then you ask, can we still talk then about a great souled person and <laughs> not mean a great brained person? Can we talk about a great souled person? Is the, is the word Mahatma silly? Well, you know, language is, is so flexible and, and we use metaphors and we use language with categories with these very fuzzy boundaries. And, and so we still say things like the sun sets, but we know full well, of course, that it's the earth turning. Mm -hmm. um, and that's fine. I mean, nobody needs to get terribly excited about that. And, and you know, if I say that Mandela was a great-souled person, I don't mean that he literally had a great big ghosty, spooky soul. I mean that, that he had certain remarkable virtues of vision and generosity and kindness. Um, that made him very special. And so, of course, I think we can use those words, just like I, I, I think it's fine 
to talk about spirituality, where we have in mind something like not caring too much about material things, about spending slow time in observation and in peaceful meditation and so forth. So, so the language, I think, is fully able to accommodate those things without us necessarily taking quite literally the idea that, you know, if you have a spiritual moment when you are out in the woods and you see a, a frozen um, waterfall, you don't need to think that somehow, oh gosh, I've had this amazing experience, so there must be a, you know, a spooky soul somewhere in my head. But what, what happens to the the great continent universe of ideas, beliefs, and divinity here. I mean, Publishers mm. Weekly reads your book. You've got lots of references in here to your uh, childhood, growing up on a Canadian farm. In a Canadian farm, Publishers Weekly says, which seems to have nurtured in her a pitiless yet folksy <laughs> atheism. <laughs> yeah, the pitiless part. Yeah, that kind of got me actually, because I thought. I mean, I uh, I understand to a degree, at least, I think, why people find solace in certain religions. But, you know, the other point here really is that religions are so diverse. And even within Christianity, there is tremendous diversity. But, of course, as soon as you think about Eastern religions, then, you know, you're into a domain where people are do not have a conception of a deity, of a lawgiver, of a creator of the universe. Okay, so you're just blowing away half the world's religious faith. <laughs> I mean, and I th I think even amongst Christianity that that there can be much wisdom as well as, of course, much silliness. Um, but and and I quite understand that people find religious music, Christian music, um, very moving and very peaceful. And you know, peacefulness in in life is hard to come by. And if you find it in a in a church listening to beautiful music, then that's okay. But of course. Religions can, but need not, also have, you know, very difficult prescriptions about how to treat others that sometimes involve treating others in ways way that I would regard as treating them badly. And, and that's, of course, where I care. Uh, I mean, but of I course, they're also vessels for treating others well. They're, they're, of I, course. I would say the greater weight in most religions goes toward uh, kindness. Well, that's possible. I don't really know. Um, there are certainly lots of things in the Bible that, you know, curl your hair uh, because they're not terribly nice. Um, recommending slavery and how to treat slaves yeah, and yeah. No, with it, regard it, it, to the treatment it, it, of women. It, it, there's and so a forth. lot of history there. So, if I may, let me bring a in. Lot, it's a mixed uh, uh, story. Yes, Jim in Nashville, Tennessee. Jim, thanks for calling. You're on the air. Hi, Tom. Uh, I would just like to say that if, if we are simply our brains and the interactions therein, and there's no spiritual realm, no soul, then all of morality, philosophy, progress, evolution, everything is basically pointless. If we just blink out when we're when we're done, I mean, it's all just absolutely pointless from, from the way I see it. Hey, Jim, I, 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 I can relate to what you're saying there, but let me just ask you, let's say, I mean, I don't know, but let's say Patricia's right. Isn't it? Wouldn't it still be important for us to treat each other well? In that, in those terms, wouldn't morality still matter? Would it be, really be pointless? If it, if this is it, if this is the life that, and I absolutely blink out and there's nothing left, then why would I not just seek out all the pleasure that I could in this life, and then just that's it? I mean, what's the point of self sacrifice or uh, or, or being moral or making a decision? What's the point of of uh, anything that does not bring me pleasure. So, so you're doing it all for a reward in heaven or the avoidance of pain in hell. But, I mean, if you if we all just seek pleasure and disregard everything else, couldn't that create a kind of hell on earth, Jim? Well, uh, that's what I'm saying. It's all pointless anyway, mm. if this is all there is. And I'm not doing it as a reward in heaven, but I believe, uh, because of some of my experiences in yeah. my life, that there is more than just this life. I believe that there is a spiritual realm um, I don't believe in hell, but I do believe that there's higher intelligence that we're a part of and that uh, our consciousness is, is basically a projection through this 
through this brain. J- Jim, uh, I appreciate your call very much. Sandy Goldberg, let me bring this one to you. If, if all we are is our brain and its synapses to Jim, then everything is pointless. As a philosopher, how do you look at that? I, I tend to, uh, I have two reactions to that. One is that um, I think that's a, that's a very, very common view. It's a view I have to, con- I have to confess to, uh, to the, the caller. Uh, members of my family hold that view. Um, so I, I, I treat that with respect, um, and I want to respectfully disagree. My impression is that there's one assumption um, that I would suggest may be uh, being made, which is that the only values that we can acknowledge are values that, that have to be grounded in something like a divine realm. And I think a lot of excellent moral philosophy and a lot of excellent social philosophy is an attempt to articulate values that exist, that can exist um, where you don't need to make one assumption or the other about uh, a divine realm. And so I would just recommend to, to folks who are worried about this to ask whether or not there are ways of understanding human values and what we value in ourselves and our relations to others and our relation to the environment that we might be able to articulate and to give an explanation for these things without appeal to to God. That said, I should tell you that the people in my family to whom I make this case, they often say thanks, but I don't agree. Uh, so I, I'll leave yeah, it at that. Yeah, uh, Patricia, let me, let me put a couple questions to you here, and, and one may relate to this. I mean, you know, let's say in the civil rights movement, Martin Luther King uh, cited, you know, the fact that we're all God's children. Uh, it's often put in those terms. But here one listener mm-hmm. says, writes, antisocial behavior such as racism is in the news a lot lately. Could it be a solidified neurological brain state after millions of years of evolution in fear of the other, as is any ingrained pattern in the brain which results in unchangeable thoughts and actions? What about that? People have, have appealed to uh, even the, our relationship with the divine to overcome what we have come to see as shortcomings. What if they're baked in the cake of our brain? Well, I think that sociability is a fundamental feature of the mammalian brain. We care for offspring. That's the fundamental platform. And that caring for others also gets extended to mates, to kin, and to others in the community. But our our listeners asking beyond that, when it comes to racism, maybe that's right in there, too. Well, I'm getting to that. Mm, (laughs) So that's okay. And, And so within the group, there can be this very tight bonding. And uh, there is some evidence, but I think this is still sort of under-researched at this point, that the in-group bonding can also have this sort of out-group hostility. And psychologists have looked at this, but so have neurobiologists. And I think there is a tendency, and it doesn't necessarily have to go along racial lines, but it does go along group lines that within the group, we trust each other, we like each other, we'll go the extra mile for each other, but we don't trust those in the out group. And sometimes I think that the aggression and the hostility to those in the out group actually is pleasurable and derives from this very tight bonding within the group. And and the neurobiology of that, I think, is very complex. But almost certainly the various forms of outgroup hostility that we see, and racism is only one, mm. uh, are probably rooted in this desire to have very tight bonding. So we recognize an accent, we recognize mm-hmm. certain hairstyles, mm-hmm. certain clothes. That That's a member of my tribe. Sounds like it's going to be a but lot somebody, of work over a long time. But if time. somebody is not a member of my yeah. tribe, I can tell instantly. Hey, I, I, and I, I'm wary. We've just got a minute. Nathaniel says he'd like to hear your thoughts on the possibilities, if it, the brain is us, the possibilities of digitization of consciousness. Uh, in the future with its attendant possibilities of functional immortality or disembodied consciousness. He's been reading Ray Kurzweil. What do you say, Patricia? Oh, heck, I don't know. I mean, I don't like predicting the future. Um, And uh, I think there will certainly be lots of surprises, whether we can digitize it all or not. You know, I'm going to leave that to Ray Kurzweil. Um, Then what do you say to people who feel diminished by, by this view? We've just got half a minute here. If you look at those people who are suffering various neurological conditions, whether it's psychiatric like schizophrenia or whether it's basic neurology like multiple sclerosis or a genetic defect, that affects the brain, it matters hugely that when they understand that they are as they are because their brain is as it is. 
a certain comfort Patricia Churchland finds in the science here and a very (laughs) profound reorientation implicit there for a lot of people if she's right. She writes about it in her new book, Touching a Nerve, The Self as Brain. I want to thank you both. Sandy Goldberg from Northwestern University in Conover, Wisconsin today. Thank you so much, Professor Goldberg. Thank you so much, Tom. Thank you, Professor Churchland. Good talking with you. And Patricia in Vancouver. Thank you very much, Patricia Churchland. Thanks a lot, Tom. I'm Tom Ashbrook. This is On Point. Thank you.